Welcome to our evening service. So glad to see you guys here this evening. Would you stand with us as we sing our new theme song, All My Ways Are Known to You. Good evening. Let's go ahead and have a word of prayer. Dear and Father, Lord, Lord, we love you. I want to thank you for really just a, a wonderful service this morning. And Lord, I pray that our hearts and minds will be attentive to you. Uh, Lord, as Pastor brings word uh, from your word tonight, Lord, that we will quit running away from our problems, but Lord, we'll 
give them over to you. Uh, lay them down at your feet. And uh, Lord, we just ask these things in your son's wonderful name. Amen. You may be seated. Well, welcome, and uh, welcome to those who are tuned in online. Well, the Lord has just been blessing our church. Uh, we've had a lot of visitors come in, but in the kids' area, we have, uh, the Lord's just been blessing us. Uh, this morning, we had 63 uh, kids. Uh, that's, I mean, that's amazing. And we've had some, we've had a lot of visitors and uh, in fact, uh, I want to share with you an activity that we had this past weekend on Friday. Um, you go ahead and show the pictures there. This is our Nerf War. This was uh, an activity we put together for fifth grade through eighth grade, trying to help that transition because in June, the sixth graders will be going in or up to our team ministry. So it's a great way to kind of bring things together, so it kind of helps that transition. But that activity... Uh, there was 30 in attendance and seven new faces that were that I mean never met never met them before, and uh, so these activities like that help uh, them to invite their friends and us to get to know them and hopefully we'll get to see them back to this church service, and so we had some fun. Nobody lost an eye, nobody got hurt, but it was fun. And then another blessing uh, is our van routes. Um, I want to share with you a praise. This is amazing stuff. Uh, about a month ago, our early van route was bringing in one, one child or one kid, and uh, that's kind of discouraging. So we started praying, and we started making some visits, and then it went from one to seven, and then went from seven to a full van route, which is about 15, and this morning, they brought in 25. That's both van routes. That's amazing. That's, that's God's work there. And uh, it is, and my van, my, my van helpers, uh, they just do a, such a wonderful job. They're willing to come here early, uh, the early route. Um, they leave at, se- this morning they had to leave a little early. Um, so early to them it would be 740 because the, it was a full route. And uh, so you may not know that, but that's something just to keep praying because that's another door where we can just continue seeing families where, they don't have any other way to get to church, and we provide that. So just keep that in mind and, and continue praying for that. And, uh, well, if you have a change of address or change of information, uh, there's a great communication card. If you just take a moment to put that uh, information on that card, if you have a change of uh, address or something like that, you can put that on the card. And then if you have a prayer request or would like to ask a question, on the back of the card you can put that there. And if you haven't already, please do silence your cell phone. Pastor. Uh, We're in Matthew 26. That's the communion passage in the Gospel of Matthew. If I can have the deacons go ahead and join me up here. Uh, Appreciate our deacons always helping serve communion. And uh, Matthew 26. The Lord gives the classic instructions about what the communion represents. Uh, The front of this table, of course, is in remembrance of me, and that's why we do it. So why do we take communion uh, once a month? We do it to remember what Christ did for us. Um, In Matthew 26, uh, verse 26 says, as they were eating. So they were taking or eating the Passover meal. Now, the Passover meal is for Jews to remember that God delivered them out of Egypt. It's not for us today, but in this transition time, they were eating the Passover meal with the Lord. This is the last night before He was crucified. And so, as they were eating, and then Jesus starts something new. He starts the Lord's Supper, communion, the Lord's table. It's called all those things. And and that's what we're doing tonight. And He says... uh, And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and break it and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. It's interesting, tonight's sermon is from John 6 where the Lord's talking about uh, this this concept of uh, the bread is his flesh and the the juice uh, is his blood. Of course, it just represents those things. 
And so, uh, but he says, when you, when you take that bread, you remember that you're remembering with that little piece of wafer, uh, you're remembering that I gave my body, uh, my life for you. And so let's, uh, let's go ahead and pass out the wafers. And Kelly Williamson will be coming and taking the gluten-free. And uh, he'll be walking down the right side over here, Kelly. And then coming back the left side. Just get his attention if you want a gluten-free wafer. And he said, take, eat, this is my body. And then it says he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them and saying, drink ye all of it. And so let's give thanks to the Lord. Lord, we not only thank you for living a perfect life so that you could be our substitute on the cross, but Lord, uh, thank you for shedding your blood for us. You didn't have to do that either. And so, Lord, as we now take the juice, let us think of the precious blood that you shed for us. Go ahead. And he said, drink ye all of it. And as we 
as we take this, remember, only the blood of Christ, it was the only blood that could have satisfied God's wrath. Remember, God himself is a spirit, but Christ came to be born into the human race so that he could have blood. And then he lived a perfect life so that his blood was not tainted by sin. He was virgin born, so sin was not passed down from an earthly father. And so it was literally the blood of God running down the cross for our sins. Drink ye all of it. And later in the passage, it says they sang a hymn. Stephen? Every month we try to remember what Christ did for us, and this, this hymn that we're about to sing uh, is a fantastic remembrance of him. Let's sing this. Once again, I thank 
Amen. This next song is called Rejoice. And I sure hope that you are rejoicing today like we are for what Christ does for us. Let's sing this. Turn in your Bible to John chapter 6, John chapter 6. Tonight, uh, a sermon on uh, quit running from your problems. Uh, First of all, it does not speak well of us when we do. Second, uh, it it shows something in us that really shouldn't be. And third, it likely uh, is a spiritual problem when we uh, consistently or 
uh, above average, run from our problems. Well, John chapter 6, let's read verse 59 through 66. Uh, Here it says, These things said he, talking about Jesus, in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Many therefore of his disciples, when they had heard this, said, This is a hard saying. Who can hear it? When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, Doth this offend you? What and if uh, ye shall see the Son of Man ascend up when he was where he was before? It is the Spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. But there are some of you that believe not. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not and who should betray him. And he said, therefore said I unto you that no man can come unto me except it were given unto him of my father. Verse 66, from that time many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Lord God, we, uh, we step into some deep waters this evening in addressing the topic of why do people run from their problems? Why do they... Uh, disengage with people? Why do they uh, move from here to there? Why do they drop out of church? Uh, Lots of things, Lord. And Lord, I pray you will give us insight into this passage as it uh, illustrates, as you teach about this, this problem that many Christians have. And so, Lord, we ask for your blessings on the reading and preaching of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, you may not know this, or maybe you do. Did you know that many Christians have a problem in staying put? Okay? Many Christians have a problem in staying put when something happens that they don't like. Or when something goes wrong, when they don't understand something. Uh, I call it CRD. Commitment Retention Disorder. Okay? Commitment retention disorder. So turn to your neighbor and say, do you have CRD? Hopefully nobody said yes, okay. Commitment retention disorder. Uh, You see, something happens. It bothers them. They they forget. They made a commitment. They, They said they'd be here. They seemed happy. They seemed content. But then without asking questions, without uh, uh, seeing if they had correct information, uh, without talking to the pastor to see if they could possibly be in the wrong, without talking to their Sunday school teacher or uh, a deacon or another person that they are friends with at church, without doing that to see if there's possibly another perspective on, on anything, Uh, without taking time to pray and ask God if it could possibly be their misunderstanding, they snuff, I'm out of here, and they raise their finger and they just say, follow me if you want to go with me. And uh, some people just do that. And frankly, sometimes I'm flabbergasted at, at this. Uh, they start ghosting the church. Now, it was Seth. Where's Seth at? Seth, Seth's up in the sound booth. Seth taught me that. He, first time, I mean, he's been here about a year and a half or two years almost, and, and something happened, and I said, well, what happened to them? And he goes, well, they're ghosting me. And I'm like, what does that mean? <laughs> what does that mean? I mean, and he goes, oh, ghosting means I, I call them, no response. I, I try to text them. They don't the text back. Uh, I send them a letter, no response. Uh, they're, they're ghost, and so now I'm telling you, I'm using this hip phrase. They they ghost the church. Now, not uh, 
Not Holy Ghost the church. I mean, that would be a good thing if they were Holy Ghost in the church. No, they're unholy ghost in the church, okay? They, uh, they used to be part of us, and now they won't even acknowledge you when, you're in, when you see them at Walmart. And, and uh, then we're spending time trying to, what, what happened? Are you okay? And no response whatsoever. Uh, it's like we never knew each other at all. Evidently, we were never friends. And I label it a disorder. Again, what is it? Commitment retention disorder. Turn to your neighbor, neighbor again and say, are you sure you don't have CRD? Turn again and ask him, are you sure you don't have CRD? And now turn to your neighbor and say, are you ever going to ghost the church? Some of you are like, well, I'm not sure yet. I don't know. I label it a disorder because that is not how a Christian is supposed to respond. You see, that trait of getting offended, getting bent, bent out of shape, getting your gander up, is part of our sinful, fallen nature. Now you're going to turn to your neighbor, and you're not going to ask him a question. You're going to tell him something. Say, you, buddy, have a sinful, fallen nature. So turn and tell somebody that you have a sinful, fallen nature. Now, if you're sitting by yourself, you have to tell yourself that. So just say it out loud. So we do have a sinful, fallen nature. And everybody always thinks they're right in whatever they do. And you know this. Nobody goes, I'm about to do something, and it's totally sinful and wrong and improper. Nobody says that. But, that, but we do, and then we always think we're in the right. But it's a disorder because that's not how a Christian is supposed to respond. That, that trait's part of our sinful, fallen nature. And by the way, it's more than just at church. There's people who quit a job with no notice. Now, I mean, if you get fired and they tell you to leave, that's one thing. But I'm talking about people, they just quit showing up. Do you realize people were counting on you? People were depending on you. Some, some leave their spouse over one mistake. I mean, maybe it was a big one, yeah, but still. Some fight over one argument. Some break off a friendship over one misunderstanding. Often small things. Some drop out of church for, well, you wouldn't believe the reasons I get. Of course, they're, evidently they're ghosting me, so I have to hear about it secondhand, you know. And, uh, I mean, you know, the, the stuff. Uh, why wasn't I asked? I said, well, it was in the bulletin that if you have questions, come talk to the pastor. Yes, but you should have known to come ask me my opinion. I'm like, well, if I did that to everybody, we'd never get anything done because I'd have to ask a thousand people what they thought and somehow find the consensus to do that. And yet, that's what they're bothered at. Again, Seth told me somebody was upset because I turned the dim lights on before they were ready. Somebody didn't like a Sunday school lesson. Somebody didn't like this. Well, they thought we should have done that. Do you realize how immature and uh, uh, are, are the junior are any junior hires in here tonight? They're not here. Okay, it's acting like a junior hire. That's what that is. <laughs> so I always want to say that, Stephen, but I never want to say it if they're in here, you know, because then they're like, "What do you mean, Pastor?" I mean, I mean, c come on. It, it's a problem with us when we act so immature that we act like a junior higher. When I, when I think about these things, I sure am glad that God isn't like that. Can you imagine God if He acted like we do? Can you imagine if God acted that way? I don't like this, God says, so I'm out of here. I didn't, like, I didn't like how you worded that prayer. That's it. I never want to talk to you again. Aren't you glad God doesn't act like that? I want to look at our passage, and again, it is a deep text, but you're going to see what I see. 
First of all, in verse 59, the Lord purposely said what He said. Now, in verse 59, these things said He in the synagogue as He taught in Capernaum. He had just got through teaching them about this concept that His flesh... They, they're going to need to eat it. He's talking about communion and his blood. He, they're going to need to drink it. I mean, if they want to be saved, he goes, I'm the bread of life. I'm the water of life. And, and you need to take me all in. Be all in. You need me for salvation. So Jesus is explaining salvation and communion to people who didn't understand. And so misunderstanding though they made and by the end of the passage it shows they made no effort to find out what he meant I mean you can read the passage over again if you want I don't hear one question I don't hear that somebody said can you uh, can you go into more detail I don't know that I get that many th- many think and I I guess I think this too. The Lord used this. He used some of His hard lessons, hard sermons to weed out the unbelievers. Now, I just want you to know, I don't always understand that. I was telling somebody this morning. They asked me a question, and I was trying my best. And I said, I just want to end with, uh, I don't know that I understand that fully. In heaven, I'm sure it'll all make sense. And uh, they, they kind of looked at me a minute like, well, you're the pastor. You're supposed to know everything. And, and, and I'm like, hey, I, I got a PhD in theology, but I, it don't matter. I, there's some things I still don't understand because that's God's business. And I don't understand why God does some things sometimes. But He's God. He doesn't need my permission or approval to do stuff. And so I just want you to know, I think the Lord was using this previous section that He had just taught in John 6 to weed out the unfaithful. I think He was weeding out those who were only following Him for food. I mean, that's what earlier they were doing. Uh, hey, give us, more, give us more bread. You passed out bread before, give us some more bread. He's a, what you really need is the manna from heaven. Good, give us manna, they said. He's like, oh, no, no, you don't understand. It's really the spiritual things I'm wanting to teach you. Well, yeah, we like spiritual things too, but do you have any more bread? Do you have some lunch meat sandwiches? I mean, that's what they wanted. And Jesus had to revert to some deep spiritual stuff sometimes to get the you know, the bandwagon people to to quit pestering him because all they wanted was benevolence fun and lunch meat sandwiches. And so I want you to think about this. The next time you're bothered or upset at something, boy, you ought to ask yourself, am I being weeded out? You see, I think that we go through lots of things. You and I, we go through lots of stuff. Has anybody been in a misunderstanding this year? Raise your hand. Anybody been in several this year? Raise your hand. Anybody been in more than several? Raise your foot in the, uh, you know, I mean, goodness sakes, the more you deal with people, the more opportunities you have that something didn't get taken like you thought it would have, but Likely, maybe you didn't word it well. I mean, I get that part, okay? And, but have you ever thought about all the stuff at work with relatives, with, you know, this, at that, that, friends, church, blah, blah, blah? Uh, have you ever thought about it's really we're being tested to see how we're going to respond? And so here's just a question. Do you, and I'm asking myself the same, do I, do you respond with grace and understanding? I'm just going to share with you, I don't always. Now, I know I'm supposed to. I may even say I usually try to, but everybody knows how something just pushes your button, right? Anybody got buttons besides me? Uh, you know, I mean, some just put, and you're like, like being ghosted. That pushes my button. I just want you to know. 
Some, I mean, I, I don't do this anymore. When I, was for, when I was early in the pastorate, I mean, you ghosted me. See, back then I didn't even know that was a term. But back then, if you ghosted me, I'm going to show up at your door. That's what I'm going to do uh, because, that, because it bugs me what you're doing. Now, I don't do that anymore. So if you want to ghost me, fine. I don't care, whatever. So, uh, but, I mean, you're hurting yourself. Anyway, verse 60 through 61, even Jesus' disciples, in, in their chatting about what Jesus just taught, even they said, listen, this is difficult. In verse 60, many therefore of his disciples, when they heard this, said, This is hard. The Lord was teaching about his flesh and blood and ended up exposing now unbelief. Have you ever thought about that sometimes? God lets hard things come our way to expose a lack of faith. I, want, I just want to, I mean, let's, let's make this very super clear and obvious. When God tells you all the reasons that something's going on, does that require any faith? When you're like, I know why that's happening. Does that require any faith? No. When he lets stuff happen and we don't get it, we don't understand, that requires some trust in God, doesn't it? Have you ever thought about maybe God allows that more often in your life because you're lacking some trust in him? I mean, there are hard things in life. We don't understand, why didn't I get a raise at work? Why did that friend just quit on me? Why did this happen with so-and-so? What, what, what's going on? I don't understand. And sometimes we say, I don't understand, and so it must be wrong. I just want to remind you, Jesus notices when we're bothered by stuff and by the way being bothered is not the problem it's letting ourselves being bothered turn into a wrong thought or feeling a belief or an action and jesus he's noticing this look in verse uh, 61 at the end of the verse jesus i mean i i just want to get to heaven i'm like jesus can i see what your face looked like when you said this because i think jesus looked at them and goes Doth this offend you? He's asking him a question. Does this offend you? Are you bothered by this? I mean, he knew they were. But now he's asking them, so you're, you're bothered by this. It's offended you. Well, in verse 62 and 63, I want to remind you, and Jesus is letting them know this, we rarely see the big picture. We rarely see the big picture. Jesus had been explaining how his death would open up eternal life. Him dying on the cross, him shedding his blood. And he's talking about, you better buy into this. You better get into this. You better wrap your mind around this. I'm going to die on the cross, and you're going to need to believe on me and trust that my death and shedding of blood on the cross is what provides salvation. You better figure this out. And they didn't. And he says, does this offend you? And then he's, then he's saying, you guys don't see the big picture. So what's he do? Well, he jumps in verse 62 to the ascension. He says in verse 62, well, what are you going to do? How are you going to feel when you see the Son of Man, me, ascend up into heaven one day? He goes, is that going to bother you? And of course the answer is no, that's not going to bother him. That sounds wonderful, doesn't it? To see Jesus returning to heaven to prepare a place for them. That wouldn't bother them. But he says, you're not going to be bothered when I ascend up into heaven. But you understand, I can't ascend and go back to heaven until I've done my job here, and that's to die for you and to shed my blood for the sins of mankind. 
So, of course, you're not bothered by the ascension, but you're bothered by me talking about that I'm going to die. You see, they didn't see the big picture. Just like we usually don't. What do we see? We see the rough side of problems, don't we? That's true. We see the rough side of problems. I mean, that's why we call it a problem, isn't it? If it wasn't, uh, if it wasn't uh, tough and rough and unenjoyable, we wouldn't call it a problem. We call it a problem because it's not enjoyable. And so we see the rough side, uh, the unfinished version. And rather than stay put, rather than ask questions, rather than dig into our Bible, rather than say, you know, Lord, I'm, I need to be very patient and ask you to fill me in here. Or maybe even do as the Apostle Paul told Christians in the New Testament, uh, how about you just take the wrong and give it to the Lord? How about you just quietly deal with it? Now, I told you this is going to be deep stuff. Here we go. How many, how many enjoy quietly just dealing with it? Yeah, nobody enjoys it because it's not very fun to keep it to yourself when you've been, somebody's done something, said something, they're out of line, they're in the wrong, and, and the Holy Spirit tells you, yeah, you just be quiet. They hurt me. Yeah, I'll be quiet. You don't know how wrong they are. Oh, yes, I do. Be quiet. You don't know what they did. Oh, yes, I do, and I know more than you do. Be quiet. That's not fair. I didn't say it was fair. Be quiet. Well, I want to tell them what I think. I know you do, and be quiet. In fact, at this point, the Holy Spirit may go into shut up, okay? The Apostle Paul dealt with that. He said, listen, take the wrong sometimes. Have the faith that God knows all about it and that God will balance it out. I, I, I just want to share this with you. I, I think it's appropriate. Uh, when I first was called to preach, my home pastor in Indiana got me to lunch with a guy up in Indianapolis, an old retired pastor. He'd pastored for 40-some, 50 years. And, and uh, of course, you know, here I am. I'm 35, chomping at the bit, can't wait all this stuff, and uh, I said, what, what's the secret of finding success in ministry? He goes, well, first of all, let's define success. Now, and his definition and mine weren't the same. I realized his was way more godly and biblical than mine, okay? And I said, okay, then how do you get that? And he looks at me, and he goes, there are lots of factors in ministry. One of the ways you'll find success is how much hurt can you take? And I'm like, well, that doesn't sound like a very fun answer, okay? <laughs> that doesn't sound very fun. How much hurt can I take? He said, how much hurt can you take? He said, because if you can take a lot of hurt that people quit on you, say stuff, chew you out, say unfair things, accuse you of stuff you never did, never even thought about doing. If you can take a lot of that, you're going to find success in ministry. And I said, how does that work? He, he said, because most pastors can't take very much, and so they dish it out like they got, and that's why very few people want them to be their friend. But if you can take a lot, people will enjoy your pastoral leadership of them if you can take a lot of hurt. And I want you to know, you want a lot of friends? You want a lot of influence at work, school, organizations? Well, how much hurt can you take? And if you're going to say very little, well, okay. Then that's a smaller circle. But the more hurt you can take, the more influence you can have because you end up with longer relationships with people. I want you to know that God knows all about it. In verse 64 and 66, Jesus knew the unbelievers were going to quit. 
and 64, but there are some of you that believe not, Jesus says, for Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not. And by the way, he knew who all about Judas already. And I think there were some probably some others besides Judas that were not given their names or their stories. But I mean, there were lots of people screaming, crucify him. Well, where did they come from? I'm just going to say some of them were part of the following of Jesus at first. He knew who they were. Verse 65 goes into some detail. Why didn't they believe? Well, they didn't believe because they didn't let the Holy Spirit work in their heart. They didn't let the Holy Spirit enlighten their spiritual eyes, understand Jesus' words. Uh, they didn't allow God to bring an understanding to their mind. And so they left. And I notice they never asked a question, never made an appointment with the Lord like Nicodemus did, by the way. Nicodemus didn't understand some stuff. What did he do? He wanted to see Jesus, made an appointment. Never talked to Jesus in length. I mean, you know, I'm going to tell you, the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman, it was really a light argument she was having with Jesus. I'm going to say kudos to her. At least she argued with Jesus for a little bit until he proved his points. A lot of people walk away, don't even want a conversation. Most people don't ask questions. You realize the disciples, now they didn't in this case, but they often asked questions. But no, the crowd here in John 6 just quit. And John later wrote a verse. I wonder if John was thinking of this passage, because you think about these disciples when they see uh, several people just walk away and leave, and I, I bet they were bothered by this. And I wonder if he thought of this passage when he wrote 1 John 2, 19 on the screen. And, it said, and this is John writing, who was, who was there in John 6? He goes, they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest or obvious that they were not of us. Now this doesn't say if you've ever quit something that you're unsaved. That's not what the point of this sermon is. The point of this sermon, be careful about running from problems. There are some principles here that I think not only are a giant in following Christ, but also really big stuff for Christian maturity and frankly a challenge to our faith. Here's some, in closing, here's some false assumptions that we often make when we run from problems. And I think this is uh, applicable to all parts of life. Here's some false assumptions we often make. We assume that what we see is the big picture. We assume that what we see is the big picture. Now you'd think about just how foolish that is. To think that we understand all the motivations, that we understand all the history of something and somebody's life and somebody's emotions and what they've gone through and their particular challenges, that we can see what this may go and lead to, what this may open up for us, what this may help us with down the road. I can tell you, my wife and I have been through some things. At the time, it was terrible, heartbreaking. But now I can tell people, and my wife can too, We've been through that. We've been through that. I want you to think about this. When we quit, we undo all the work that God has put into us so far. I mean, you'll get this. How long does it take to make friends at work? They're not made in a week or a month. They're, they're made in really in years. How long does it take to show that you're a good neighbor? It takes a long time. How long does it take to be effective at a church? Quite a while. 
Because most churches, and again, we practice this, you don't walk in uh, this coming Sunday and we put you uh, in the kids' ministry the the Wednesday after that. That's not how that works. It takes a while to, to build up that ability to be trusted for you yourself to know what's going on. So don't quit because you're undoing all of that. It takes years to make good friends, gain their trust. It takes, I think, decades to build a reputation, a testimony. And sometimes we just sell out like that. Secondly, we assume we understand the whole story. What a, what a false assumption that usually is. And by the way, I have been guilty of this. Somebody will say something, and uh, I'll respond, and then, and then I, you know, at some point I find out, okay, I didn't really understand what was going on, and I could have ju- should have just kept my mouth shut and listened better. If we can be patient, and here's what I've learned, if we can be patient, most questions end up being answered in time and we didn't have to ask or say a thing those things just play out but impatient people and listen to this now impatient people who struggle with faith always need to know everything all the time right now because they can't be patient they can't trust that anybody else could do a good job at something Give people an opportunity to do right, fix things, give God an opportunity to work some things out and reveal what's up. Thirdly, we assume that if we don't like it, it must be wrong. Twice in the Bible, in Moses' day and Jesus' day, there were some guys preaching who were not officially approved by Moses and then later by Jesus. And guys came to Moses and the disciples came to Jesus and said, Hey, you tell them to stop it. They don't don't have your authorization. They don't have their union card. They're not ordained. They didn't go to a Bible college. They're not like us. We're here with you. And both Moses and Jesus said, Leave them alone. I'm thankful for them and anybody that's preaching God's truth. I want you to know sometimes you and I are going to run across things and we don't personally say, well, you know, I wouldn't have done it that way. Okay, you wouldn't have done it that way. But that doesn't mean it's wrong. Now, I want you to understand there is a difference between a biblical conviction and a personal preference. Now, i got lots of personal preferences. You do too. Personal preferences, well, that's how I like it. Okay, fair enough. I like lots of things. But be careful about raising your personal preferences up to the level of biblical convictions. That's, uh, I mean, that's a sin. The Bible says, do not make the opinions of man the same as the commandments of God. And then lastly, we assume God couldn't possibly be trying to teach us something. Maybe what you're encountering at work isn't the best. Maybe somebody in your family, they're not, they're not choosing the wisest choice. Maybe, maybe somebody you know does have some personality quirks. By the way, I think everybody's got personality quirks. In fact, turn to somebody and say, you've got personality quirks. Now, if, you don't, if you're not doing that right away, you've shown me you have a bigger personality quirk, okay? Everybody's got personality quirks. Somebody say, well, they're weird. Well, everybody's weird, just to differing degrees, I suppose. So somebody's got personality quirks. So something didn't go like you thought it should have. But if everything and everybody was perfect, where... Would the opportunity be to be gracious, understanding, patient, to have faith that God's got it, or that just possibly 
Maybe there's something for us to learn in the process. I want you to know, don't run from problems. Say, Lord, what can I do to show graciousness? What can I do to help? What can I do to stay put? Well, let's close with a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you for your word. Lord, I pray that each and every one here, myself included, would be bothered less, offended less, be more gracious and stay put. Lord, help us with this. And we all struggle with this in different aspects and degrees. Lord, forgive us. In Jesus' name, amen. And now what you can do, the last thing you have to do before you leave is turn to somebody and go see you next week. Okay. Stay put.